Okay, so now we're going to discuss neural basis of behavior. So, understand when we're talking about neural, we're talking actually about the brain's foundation, those building blocks of the brain. So we're going to start with your brain and how the rest of the nervous system essentially will consist of neurons. Each one is a tiny information system that processes thousands of connections uh, that will receive as well as send electrochemical signals <clears throat> to other neurons within your brain. Now, each human body really can have as many as a trillion neurons. Now, be careful not to confuse the term neuron with term nerve, okay? Nerves are those large bundles of axons that's outside of the brain and within the spinal cord. So, Neurons, they're going to be held in place and supported by what we call glial cells. And this makes up at, at approximately 90% of the brain cells. They are also where your nutrients as well as oxy oxygen will come from. It helps in cleanup tasks as well as help to insulate, which is the myelin sheath, from one neuron to another. Okay, It helps the neural messages not get all scrambled up and mixed up. Also, it plays a direct role within your nervous system communication. So, however you see the star of the communication show, realize it is going to be the neuron. So, just as a reminder, the glia cell is going to help to provide that nutrition, the structure, as well as uh, uh, support uh, with the communications. Um, and besides being called glia, it could also be called neuroglia. Now, there are no two neurons that will be alike. Most of them are going to have a basic shape, which will be the dendrites, the cell body, as well as the axon. Now, the cell body can also be known as a soma. So, in order to help you to remember how this information travels through a neuron, I want you to look at the reverse order of <clears throat> dendrite, then cell body, then axon. So the neuron's basic function would be to transmit information throughout your nervous system. And what it does is it kind of speaks uh, through the electrical and chemical language. This process of neural communication will start with the neuron itself and then it's going to move through the dendrites as well as the cell body. And then what happens is it receives electrical mes messages um, and those messages will move along the axon in the form of what we call a neural impulse and or, and this is something I want you to remember, action potential, okay? Now, the action potential is going to move much more slowly than an electricity through a wire. Those neural impulses will travel along a bare axon, and it's only going to go about 10 meters per second. Understand that electricity itself moves at about 36 million meters per second, so that you can see just how slow uh, that firing would be with a neural impulse. With some accent axons, it's going to be enveloped within a fatty insulation. And uh, you heard me mention it before, it's called a myelin sheath. This sheath will blanket the axon and basically, uh, with the exception of some periodic nodes, what it does is points um, which the myelin um, can be very thin and present, it's going to help to transmit that information a little faster. So that myelinated axon uh, is going to take the action potential and move it at least 10 times faster. So it's going to jump from 10 to 100, okay, within a bare axon because that action potential pretty much at those thin points will jump from one node to the next node rather than travel along as slowly across the entire axon. It's kind of now taking shortcuts. You can think of it that way. So when we're talking about communication with the neurons, 
basically this process will start within the neuron itself and then the dendrites in the cell body it'll take in information which travels down the same length of the axon which is via a brief traveling of the electrical charge again that electrical charge is called an action potential this is describing pretty much the steps which are three and you can take a look inside the uh, slide which kind of demonstrates it for you <clears throat> so the first one would be a resting potential that's outside of the axon no real communication is going on uh, right now the membrane is um, kind of polarized and resting you'll then move into the action potential phase and as you can see in the slide what it does is depolarization and pretty much the ions are now going to flow with inside the membrane which moves us into how the speeding of the action potential as it repolarizes it goes through and it goes back up and it's pushing so you can see potassium ions flowing out um, and it's helping to make the communication flow much better. So when action potential reaches the branch and axon uh, terminals, what happens is it'll be triggering a terminal button at the axon's end to help it to open and release thousands of neurotransmitters into the synapse. Now the synapse is that tiny little opening that's going to be sending uh, that in, sending as well as receiving uh, neurons. These chemicals will then move across the synaptic gap. It's going to attach to uh, membranes of the receiving neuron. Now with this, it's, they'll carry messages from the sending neuron to the receiving neuron. So each neuron will get multiple neurotransmitted messages. And these neuro, neurotransmitters, what happens is they'll deliver uh, either an excitatory or inhibitory message. And that receiving neuron will only produce an action potential and pass along the message if the number of the excitatory messages outweighs the in a, <clears throat> excuse me, inhibitory uh, messages, inhibitory messages, excuse me again happens when we get dry throats. Excuse me one moment. All right, so given that there are some neurons will have thousands of receptors, which are going to only be responsive to specific neurotransmitters, what happens to those excess neurotransmitters? or to those that really don't fit into the adjacent receptor sites, pretty much the sending neuron will normally reabsorb that excess. And that's what we call reuptake. Or they might just get broken down uh, by some um, enzymes. So how do our neurotransmitters help us? Neurotransmitters remember our chemicals um, that's released by neurons um, and what happens is it affects the other ones so research has been able to discover that there are hundreds of substances that would function as a neurotransmitter and these substances will help to regulate a big huge amount of our physiological processes one benefit of us being able to look and study the brain would be how to see neurotransmitters helps in understanding some of the uh, medical issues that we might have. So for an example, uh, we kind of understand and know that when there are low levels of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, uh, it is associated with Parkinson's disease. Whereas high levels of dopamine would contribute to some forms of schizophrenia. Now the table that you see uh, on the slide kind of names some of the uh, more uh, well-known or more widely used neurotransmitters. 
please make sure that when you're um, reading this part in the text that you do take time to have an understanding of each. We have acetylcholine. This is dealing with muscle actions, memory, uh, your uh, sleep habits in terms of rapid eye movement, uh, as well as it also plays a role when uh, it's lacking. It plays a role in Alzheimer's disease. In terms of dopamine, as I mentioned before, uh, it can, uh, when there's uh, too much, can lead to schizophrenia or too little can be Parkinson's disease. But dopamine has other actions as well. And as you can see on the slide, it talks about how uh, your attention may be, it helps with movement, our memory, your ability to learn, as well as how your emotions are going to be. It also helps in within our reward system, okay? That dopamine will help boost us when they need it and give us that pleasure feeling that we always seek in, in form of contentment. Now, the athletes, uh, if you're an athlete, then you kind of understand the process of endorphins, which is a neurotransmitter. But pretty much what it also does is it helps with our mood. It helps us in terms of our pain. So when I say athletes would know about this, when you get hurt and you play through it, uh, the endorphins are going to help pump up. And so is the epinephrine or adrenaline, uh, which helps, again, in terms of um, the endorphins is going to help your mem uh, memory, it's going to help you with learning, it helps with your appetite, even sex. Uh, the adrenaline helps with the emotional arousal, uh, how we keep our, our memories, those experiences that we want to, our brain want to hold on to. It also works with our metabolisms in terms of glucose and lets our body know when to release um, energy. So for those who are diabetic, you can imagine that this particular neurotransmitter may be off some way. Now GABA, which is gamma aminobutyric uh, acid, is part of with uh, the inhibition in the central nervous system. Pretty much what it does is it helps to be like a tranquilizer. Think about Valium or Xanax. That's what GABA's um, responsibility is. It allows us to decrease anxiety when it's built up naturally. Norepinephrine or the noradrenaline again helps with memory. So you notice that there's several neurotransmitters that actually overlap with one another. But the norepinephrine will help you with your memory. It helps you with learning. It helps our emotions. Um, it's the uh, neurotransmitter that helps you to wake up. It helps you in terms of being able to eat, how uh, aware you are, um, as well as your reactions to stress. Now, low levels of norepinephrine has been associated with depression and higher levels is with manic states or agitation. So if you think about bipolar, you're thinking about how norepinephrine might be impacting it. Serotonin is that neurotransmitter that helps with our mood, helps us with, I don't know if you heard the saying, woo-sa, that calm, cool, collected type mood. Well, serotonin helps with that. It also helps us in falling asleep. It allows us to um, feel satiated with our appetites. It's helping with our um, sensory perceptions. Uh, it helps with temperature regulation, pain suppression as well as those times we're feeling a little impulsive. So depression here again may occur because of low levels of serotonin. Now there's another type of communication system that exists and that second uh, system is made up of glands and its glands is called the endocrine system. So Rather than the use of neurotransmitters, now we're going to start talking about how hormones play in carrying messages um, to the necessary places within our body. So think about, think of it in this way. Neurotransmitters are those individual emails that you send to your friends and family 
and pretty much the neurotransmitters, they're going to take send messages to specific receptors. Like you might send an email to your BFF. Whereas in with hormones, now we're talking more globally. Like when I send an announcement out for your assignments or when I send a, 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 a message to the entire class, more or less, that's how the hormones would work. It is sending a message to everything that's involved. The endocrine glands will release hormones that will go straight into your bloodstream and basically travels uh, throughout the entire body, allowing messages uh, to go to any uh, cell that will listen. So your hormones pretty much, again, is that global type of email and it's just going out to a whole lot of people um, and in this case, a whole lot of cells through your body. So a way to think about it could be if you look, think in your brain, there is a part of your brain called the hypothalamus. And what the hypothalamus does is it's going to release those hormones, which would signal the pituitary, um, and that's another brain structure, uh, it's going to signal the pituitary gland that will stimulate or inhibit the release of other hormones. So hormones now, again, is manufactured by the endocrine glands. It circulates through the bloodstream. It'll help to produce those bodily changes as well as maintain your bodily functions. The endocrine system has got a real important functioning, okay, in terms of it regulates long-term processes like growth as well as your sexual characteristics. It's going to also help in terms of uh, our digestion and elimination. So how the food is broken down, the endocrine system. How you release and defecate, the endocrine system. So finally, in terms of talking about hormones, know that it controls the body's responses, particularly in terms of emergencies. There are times when we are in crisis that the hypothalamus is going to send out messages through two different pathways, that being the neural system and then the endocrine system. And when I say the endocrine system, for the most part, it's going straight to the pituitary gland. This sends hormone messages to the adrenal glands, which is right above, it's right over your kidneys, and the adrenal glands will release cortisol. Um, now, cortisol is a stress hormone that's going to help boost your energy, help work with the blood sugar levels. It helps with epinephrine, uh, also known more like adrenaline, as well as uh, norepinephrine and non-adrenaline. Now these are the same chemicals remember that also works as neurotransmitters and we're going to talk more about cortisol uh, when we get to the chapter on stress because just think of it this way too much of anything is never a good thing. Just keep that in mind and once you get to reading uh, the chapter on stress you'll see just what I'm speaking about. All right so let's talk a little bit about poisons and drugs and how it affects the brain. Start off by thinking about snakes, which oof, I hate snakes. But anyway, the majority of snake venom as well as other poisons like botulinum toxins or Botox can really affect our muscle contractions but you know what? Some of these same poisons actually can help treat uh, various medical conditions that would involve um, abnormal muscle contractions. So just like we, you see on TV all day long, some people for cosmetic reasons will have Botox placed in parts of their bodies like their lips or where there's bags that's going to um, help to smooth out the wrinkles, so to speak. That's what I mean. Now, I'm going to stop here. Um, and 
when we get back together, we will start talking more about the nervous system's organization, that being the central nervous system, excuse me, and the peripheral nervous system. So on that note, have a great weekend. Hope to see you uh, Monday, um, and hope I'll be 100% better by then. Take care.